This is Thinking in Public, a program dedicated to intelligent conversation about frontline theological and cultural issues with the people who are shaping them. I'm Albert Muller, your host and president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. Phil Zuckerman is a professor of sociology and secular studies at Pitzer College. After earning his PhD in sociology from the University of Oregon, Professor Zuckerman has had a distinguished scholarly and teaching career and innovator in the academic world. He has served as a guest professor at the University of Aarhus in Denmark, as well as an affiliated faculty member for the Claremont Graduate School since 2002. He also founded the first secular studies department in the nation at Pitzer College in 2011. He's the author of numerous books and academic articles, but it is his most recent book, Beyond Doubt, The Secularization of Society, that is the topic of our conversation today. Professor Zuckerman, welcome to Thinking in Public. Oh, thank you for having me. My pleasure. I should say welcome back. In 2015, we had a conversation about your book, Living the Secular Life. So uh, this is round two, so to speak. I'm I'm so glad you had me back. I guess I did something all right. I wasn't too offensive, I guess. No, you're dealing with big questions, and that's what we like to uh, that's what we like to grapple with. In your new book, co-authored with Isabella Kosselstrand and Ryan Cragen, uh, you basically take on one of the biggest arguments of the last century, and that comes down to whether or not uh, secularization is inevitable, and whether or not the United States is uh, now following in a secularizing trend. We both have a lot at stake in this argument, and uh, I think it's a good thing we uh, we discuss this publicly. Tell me about the book, and tell me about the argument you're trying to make here. Yeah, um, so I guess I wouldn't say that we think secularization is inevitable. Uh, okay. We would say it's just simply possible and seems to be happening. And if we had to make a bet, we we see it continuing into the future, but there are always things that can change. And so we don't see secularization as some kind of inevitable, you know, model of history and it's going to happen no matter what. In fact, I can think of many reasons why it may uh, reverse and decline. So basically, in a nutshell, uh, when I was in graduate school 30 years ago, the reigning uh, 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 scholar in sociology of religion was a man named Rodney Stark, recently deceased. And he had a whole uh, um, group of scholars supporting him, people like Roger Finke, Lawrence Iannacone, and others who all felt like the old the old secularization thesis that had been first uh, articulated or broached by some of the earlier uh, uh, founders of sociology, people like Emil Durkheim, a little bit from Max Weber, certainly uh, others who, th- and, well, Freud, he was a psychologist, but there were many who sort of predicted the, the demise of religion. They didn't have much in the way of data, but they had this sense that that's what was happening. And Stark and his colleagues said, well, they were wrong. Uh, religion is stronger than ever. Secularization was a perhaps a misguided wish by some cranky atheists. And the truth is that religion's stronger than ever. So when I was in graduate school, that was that was <laughs> doctrine. That was truth. Um, wasn't the case in Europe, but it was here in the United States. Now, 30 years later, uh, the data seems to show, and I remember Isabella Castlestrand, my, my colleague, was also in school at the time, and she's a Swede, and she was an undergraduate at the time at a Cal State school, and she read Stark's work and was like, I just don't think this is right. And her professor said, well, go do the research and see if you can prove it wrong. Um, and Ryan, myself, and Isabella were all sociologists who study religion, and all the data that we're accessing and looking at shows that religion has, in fact, uh, plummeted in most countries around the world, certainly the developed uh, democracies, no doubt about that. And so we we said, you know what, Stark was wrong, and secularization actually is definitely occurring in uh, all over the world. Yeah, but not evenly. And uh, that was one of the points that, uh, that Roger Stark and many others made, say, a generation ago. Uh, they really weren't contesting in many ways what had taken place in Europe, particularly in Northern and Western Europe, with a, a rather radical and and uh, high-velocity secularization. But the question was whether or not uh, the United States of America in particular was uh, exceptional. Is this an exception to the rule? Uh, in your book, you cite one of the most, I think, uh, suggestive sentences in this entire debate. It comes from Stephen Bruce, or Steve Bruce. Uh, back in 2002, where he said that modernization creates problems for religion. And, uh, you know, that you, you mentioned Durkheim, you mentioned Weber, 
uh, there was baked into that argument a, a, a kind of sense of inevitability. Uh, and I'm, I'm not holding you to it, but a kind of a sense of inevitability that where the modern age uh, reigns, religion is ipso facto in retreat. Uh, it didn't turn out evenly true, but I think the point of your book is you think it is largely true. Well, you know, basically, we're, it's an empirical question. How do you measure religion? How do you define religion? And then what do you see it happening over time? And people define religion different ways. So if you want to define religion as, um, you know, concern for ultimate questions, uh, well, then a Marxist is a religious person. A you know, if you want to define it narrowly or broadly, that's going to change. We try to limit it to the three Bs: belief, behavior, and belonging. Belief in supernatural things, uh, belonging to religious organizations, and behaviors, church attendance, and so on and so forth. If you take those measures, the best available available data over time shows that those those measures of religiosity are definitely declining in the societies that secularization theory would predict it, where there's existential security and so on and so forth. And so, yeah, the United States uh, is following that trajectory. We're, we're behind, you know, we're not as far along as Sweden or Scotland, uh, but we are, the, the, those same measures and those same uh, trends are now more than apparent, abundantly so here in the United States as well. Yeah, you know, I think it's, it's uh, good to have this conversation in part because you're the author of Living the Secular Life, uh, you identify, uh, you know, personally with that worldview. I think you were the the first professor of secular studies uh, with that title in the United States. So that's quite an historical hallmark. Well, thank you. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm an evangelical, you know, Christian theologian. So we ought to be able to have a good argument or a good, a good conversation here. Let me just stipulate up front. I don't think you're completely wrong. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, a lot of what you present in this book is uh, material... I basically have been using in arguments because I do not deny that secularization is taking place. I have felt that the cost to uh, to Christian uh, theology by many of the sociological arguments is that they'll claim anything as uh, evidence of uh, of a resistance to secularization. So I want to say, as you define religion, belief, behavior, and belonging, uh, and and by the way, not in that order, but those three words. Uh, I, I want to say I appreciate the fact you put belief in there because I think there are many sociologists who are very tempted to look at anything that moves and say that that's religion and and mm. you don't do that. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Indeed. So, so uh, play that out a bit, if you will, for me. I mean, so how much belief do you have to have in, in, in order not to be secular? You use the word supernatural. And again, I appreciate yeah. that. So can you play that out just a bit in sure. terms of how that operates? You know, it's actually the one area where Rodney Stark and I agree. <laughs> Rodney Stark and his author, William Sims Bainbridge, uh, in, in, in many of their books, they said, you know, a religion that, does, that lacks supernatural assumptions or beliefs yeah. is no religion at all. So that's kind of where we make the cut. Uh, if you believe in the existence of uh, entities or things or forces or beings that can't be empirically proven through standard mechanisms, uh, through appealing to our senses, uh, that can be replicated in, in a double blind study or whatever. If you believe, so that's God, gods, goddesses, demons, devils, angels, reincarnation, all that stuff. That's traditionally what, what we would typically mean by supernatural beliefs. And now people can still identify as religious. Uh, you can, there's a lot of people who say, sure, I'm Jewish, but I don't believe in the religion. It's a cultural identity. I have lived in Scandinavia. There's a lot of uh, Scandinavians who identify as Christian or Lutheran as a kind of cultural heritage, even though they don't believe in any of the biblical stories or even Jesus's resurrection. But they, so there's many ways to be religious. There are many Buddhist traditions. It's more ritual based as opposed to faith based. Um, but we would argue that what what makes religion religion, as is distinct from nationalism or Marxism or soccer fans or chess clubs, is the belief in in, in supernatural beings or forces or entities. For yeah, sure. so just let me press you on that. By the way, I, I agree with you. I appreciate that. That's how this started out. I uh, am very frustrated on both sides of the argument. By the way, there are religious sociologists, even those who identify you know, with uh, Christian sociology. Absolutely. Who I think make atrocious arguments in which they'll they'll claim just about anything as evidence okay. of religious belief. As a theologian, I find that very very problematic. But I appreciate that. I, I I I do I do wonder what you do with something like uh, you know 
three headlines in secular newspapers in the last uh, couple of weeks on manifesting. You know, there, yeah. there's no theism there. So in what category do you put that stuff? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it's murky and fuzzy. You know, that's why we're a soft science. We're not looking at, we're not isolating chemicals in a beaker. Uh, we're dealing with social phenomena that have cultural context, historical context, even linguistic aspects. So yeah, I get that question a lot. What's the difference between someone who says they're spiritual, but not religious? We hear this a lot, manifesting. Oh, you want that job? Well, you're going to manifest it. Is that religion? Is it super superstition? Um, it's too fuzzy for me. I, I can't give you a hard and fast uh, exact a definition of when a belief is supernatural, when it's theism. But but generally, theism has to have some God component. That's what the root of the word theo is, God. Um, what do we do with someone who says, uh, for example, Jains, uh, one of the oldest religions in the world, do not are atheistic. They don't believe in a God, but they certainly believe in the soul's reincarnation and samsara and, and, and nirvana. So there's a lot of supernatural stuff at play. It just right. doesn't have isn't directed by a God. So it's not right. theistic, but it's certainly supernatural faith. Yeah, I, I would say that uh, as a Christian theologian, the key issue there is that theism requires uh, identity of the uh, of theos, uh, you know, some some kind of personal theism. Whereas supernatural can be just kind of baked into a cosmological cake. Can I ask you a question? Even though certainly. I... <laughs> so, for example, when I was in Scandinavia and I would yeah. interview people and say, "Are you Christian?" and they would say, "Yes." Uh, definitely we're Christian. I say, well, do you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins? No. Do you believe Jesus was resurrected? No. Do you believe in Adam and Eve? No. Do you believe in God? Well, I don't really know what that means. I mean, would you call those people Christian? Uh, no. As a Christian theologian, I would not. Okay. Uh, I, I would tell you, though, uh, as you mentioned, you sometimes need a third category. Right. And that is, what kind of non-believer are you? Right. And, and in this case, they're Christian non-believers. So, that, that that is to say, their worldview, even their understanding of history, and, and, and perhaps their own family, is deeply saturated in historic Christianity. But they're not believers themselves. So, I mean, not only am I an evangelical, you know, by definition, or uh, as a orthodox, and by the, I mean a, a holding to the classical Christian tradition, but I'm of course a conversionist. So, right. Uh, you I know, love there, it. I love that might, you got me on your show. <laughs> yeah. Well, there 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 might be other you know Christian theologians who would define things more generously, but I would see sure. them as the problem, not the solution. Sure. I want to talk about two massive, massive questions. And uh, one of them is kind of in the background to your book, it is in the foreground. So uh, I, I, I've been looking forward to this conversation because I, I want to ask you some questions uh, in the cracks of your book, so to speak, you know, in between. Please. So in the background to your book is the fact that what we call secularization which I define as the uh, uh, a recession in the binding authority of theism, uh, okay. you know, secularization. There, there's no sane person who questions that it took place in Northern and Western Europe and in a remarkably short amount of time, and that it didn't happen here in the same way. So let's just say it's question one, question two. Question one, what in the world happened in Europe? How do you explain that sociologically? Oh, yeah. Um, there's no one single cause, so I'll give you several. Yeah. Number one, um, Europe, you have to remember, it post-World War II led the world in creating excellent, sound welfare for their citizens. So that's cheap, affordable, excellent child care, cheap, affordable, excellent elder care, cheap, affordable, excellent education all the way through graduate school, free, free, free and subsidized, uh, extremely uh, peaceful democracies um, post-World War II, of course. Um, so when you have societies where people's basic existential needs are met very well. No one is starving street in the homeless, in the home streets homeless. People have excellent health care, mental health care, physical health care, elder care, child care, free subsidized health care. I mean, when these things are institutionalized soundly and well, you will see the need for religion for many people plummet because religion tends to help when you're suffering. So when suffering is alleviated, it's never erased. You, no matter how great things are, you still can get cancer, you can still get hit by a bus. But when you have excellent 
structures like that, which which Northern Europe, particularly Scandinavia, but also the UK, led the way on that front. You see the same thing in Asia. Once Japan, post World War II, puts in again excellent public education, public health care, elder care, religiosity plummets. Same thing in South Korea. So it's not just Europe. That's number one. Number two, you have a lot of societies in Europe that are were fairly monocultural, right? So Norway was not a multicultural society for the most part. So you had a strong sense of belonging to your ethnic or national place um, that we don't have here in the United States. Here in the United States, we have so much linguistic, racial, ethnic, class, religious diversity. We move around a lot for work, for jobs. So we don't have that strong sense of community that you can get just from being a Dane or being a Scot. So you have the excellent existential security. You have strong cultural institutions already in place. And I would say you have a, a high percentage of women working outside of the home in the paid labor force. When you have a high percentage of women working outside in the home in the paid labor force, we also see a plummeting of religiosity. So there are a lot of things about Europe. We're a nation of immigrants. Europe is not. And so that immigration process tends to increase religiosity. But everything I just said about Europe, it's the flip side here. We have the worst poverty rates, the greatest inequality, every nine-year-old with an AK-47. We have high the highest murder rates. We have the highest obesity rates. We have the highest child poverty rates. We have no free health care. We're the only industrialized democracy in the world that doesn't have subsidized health care. So you can see how these things work uh, in certain directions. But there's one thing you didn't mention that I think is an essential part of this, and maybe you just don't factor this highly into your analysis, but it, it seems to me that the rise in the modern age of a new set of intellectual conditions has a lot to do with this, uh, because, uh, and, and this goes well before World War II, or for that matter, even World War I, although I would argue that uh, just in terms of social processes, those two massive cataclysms certainly served as kind of a velocity accelerators for social change uh, there in, in Europe. But uh, the rise of the modern European university, I think, has to have something to do with this. Even, even changing from, say, uh, you know, Christian orthodoxy being the curriculum to a, a basic suspicion of religion being built into the academic system. But we'll just take the rise of the modern university, rising uh, rates of higher education, higher education itself being yeah. an engine of secularization. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and the European models, especially so. Absolutely. There's no question that uh, the more a population, I mean, there's so many factors here, it's hard for me to keep them all on right. the top of my head. But educate, hot, the more education educated a population is, literacy rates going up, scientific knowledge going up, uh, 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 all of those factors um, tend to decrease religiosity. No question about that. Whether the role specifically of the modern university in Europe, I mean, that's tricky. Let, let's let's remember that um, even uh, uh, um, you know John Stuart Mill could not attend university in England because he wouldn't profess his faith in God and Jesus. So up until well through the 1800s, the, the universities right. of Europe were still dominated by a certain theology. And if you didn't subscribe to that, you couldn't attend. So it's only very recently that we have the so-called free thought, you know, reigning in universities. But yes, I would agree that that strong universities and, and literacy rates certainly uh, uh, decrease religious faith, particularly in supernatural claims. No question about that. Yeah. And I would also say, again, as a Christian theologian, that the de minimis uh, theology that was represented kind of structurally in those, especially continental European universities, uh, they implied far more than they delivered. Uh because I mean, you, you know, if, if you have Adolf von Harnach as the, uh, you know, the provost of your institution, uh, uh, you're not exactly a bastion of Christian orthodoxy, regardless of what the chancellor says. Gotcha. <laughs> um, I want to ask you a couple of questions again in in the background. So before we get to your argument uh, with uh, Rodney Stark and others, it's just still in the background a bit. Let me ask you. Uh, about a, a, a few nations, because you're looking at this longitudinally, at least in part, and over your research. So uh, let's talk about Germany for a moment. I, I think most people will be shocked to know that in many ways, the central political tradition and power in Germany since World War II has been the Christian Democratic Party. Uh, and they, they, they still have Christian written not only into their name, but into uh, you know, their political philosophy. And, and of course, every, uh, every German taxpayer has to make a decision as to whether he or she identifies as a member of some church. And then there's confiscatory taxation that then gets to the churches, which is why, for instance, the, the Roman Catholic Church in Germany 
is relatively small in numbers, but it's massive in wealth. Uh, how do you explain a Germany? In other words, what, what was going on there? Conrad Adenauer, end of World War II, Cold War, welfare state. What, what's going on there? How do you explain Germany? You know, it's not my area of expertise. I would say you have to account for what, you know, it was split in two, East Germany, West Germany. Right. East Germany saw a forced, you know, Soviet atheism that was a disaster. West Germany didn't experience that, uh, experienced more prosperity, more democracy, then there was unification. I don't know enough about the details. Even the Christian Democrats, I don't know if that's Christian in terms of heritage or Christian in terms of I, I'm washed in the blood of my Savior Jesus. I, I don't know the depths of that. I, I don't think it was ever the latter. I, okay. I, I, right. I, I, I think it was far more Christian in terms of kind of a Bismarckian fusionism, you know, just, to, okay. you know, we need, we yeah. need Christianity. We need the church right. as kind of the bulwark of the state. Exactly. I mean, what I can tell you though, is yeah. that secularization has been extreme in, in Germany as well. Yeah. Faith in God is, is all time low. Belief in Jesus, all time low. Church attendance, all time low. I mean, every indicator, whether it's frequency of prayer, belief that the Bible was written by a, a deity, any, whatever you want, it's really plummeted in Germany, both East and West. Yeah. The other uh, really interesting test case for me is it hits closer to home in the English-speaking world, and that is the UK. Um, and uh, I, I, I studied there back in, uh, in, in the, uh, the middle of the 1980s for a brief time, and I thought I was witnessing a hinge of history, honestly, as I was there, because uh, that was during the Thatcher years. And, and there, there was just this enormous sense of uh, uh, public commitment to Christianity, but at the same time, the attendance figures were plummeting. I mean, it, it, and it, it wasn't a soft glide; it was more like a walk off a cliff after World War II. Yeah. Uh, so, I, you know, again, I'm not asking you to be an expert on Britain, but I mean, that's getting closer to home. At, at the very time, people were saying, "Well, the United States is not doing this." Everyone was acknowledging in the UK secularization oh, yeah. was happening. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Not only is church attendance at an all time low, but you now have we now have six democracies where there's more people who say they don't believe in God than do. That's just a historical first. And UK is one of them. It's Estonia, Czech Republic, the Netherlands, Sweden, Norway. Uh, UK and South Korea, where you, where you, I, I'm excluding dictatorships because I can't do reliable social sur uh, surveys there, whether they're religious dictatorships or atheist dictatorships, it's the same problem. So among democracies, uh, UK now, I mean, the, the, the dramatic decline in all aspects of religion is just stunning there, you bet. Scotland, particularly. Right, where, where, quite frankly, my Presbyterian colleagues would be most offended because uh, it, it was thought that even as you look at logical positivism and all these things happening in Britain, yeah, but there's not that's not going to happen in Scotland. Uh, so if anything, Scotland's uh, plunge may be steeper and less predictable. Okay, so at the same time, here's the big, big question number two. Uh, people were saying, well, is the United States just on a delayed fuse? Because at the very same time the plummet was happening in the UK, I mean, people are talking about uh, massive Christian identity. I mean, we're we're putting in God we trust, and uh, uh, you know, on the on coins, we are uh, uh, putting under God in the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, uh, Dwight Eisenhower goes and dedicates the headquarters of the National Council of Churches and uh, says this is you know central to American identity. Um, and it looked like it was true. You know, Will Herberg, I, I, I know you're familiar with him. You know, he, he basically said the American identity comes down to a, you know, a three-legged stool, Protestant, Catholic, Jew. Everyone outside of that is outside of mainstream American culture. Okay, so why did they think that then? Were they wrong? <laughs> um, you know, our big enemy was the Soviet Union, and the Soviet Union was— um, proudly, disgustingly, uh, barbarically atheistic. So we had to go the other way. If the Soviet Union loved apple pie, we would have denounced apple pie. If the Soviet Union loved, you know, classical music, we would have been, say, we're the land of jazz. I mean, the bottom line was you had an unfree, totalitarian human rights nightmare in the name often of atheism. So we doubled down on our theism. We said, oh, if that's what 
communism looks like and we're you know we're the land of the free we're going to double down on our on our faith in god and, and i'm so glad you acknowledge that we added those uh, uh sentiments to our coins we changed our national model from e pluribus unum to one nation under god we inserted that phrase into the pledge of allegiance so i saw that more as a rallying the troops of democracy capitalism christianity theism you know in the face of this horrible soviet menace and and we were quite religious back in the 50s in terms of the measures church attendance belief in god was well over 96 percent um identification almost nobody identified as non-religious so back then it was fairly accurate you know eisenhower had his finger on the pulse of, of the general american public now Every church attendance rates are down. Uh, rates of belief in God are down. Rates of belief that the Bible is is divine in origin is down. Rates of, I mean, people even just saying they're religious. So all this, so I just think there was a delayed reaction here. The United States was not didn't secularize as soon or as early or as swiftly or dramatically as say Scotland or Sweden. Uh, uh, but we're catching up. I don't know if we'll ever get to that level, but we have certainly uh, shown that we're not immune to secularization here in the United States. Yeah, that's very helpful, uh, Professor. By the way, Dwight David Eisenhower was the first and only president of the United States to be baptized as a Christian while president. Wow. Yeah. Something that a lot of people don't recognize. So that is that, so uh, interesting. I yeah, had no idea. Yeah, absolutely. At a at a church right there in Washington D.C. Wow. Uh, that still begs a question to me, though. So, in other words, the Cold War is, if anything, uh, just as threatening to Western Europe. Uh, after all, they're even closer uh, to the, uh, the and, and more scarred by World War II. So, in other words, still, I'm pressing that a little bit. I still want to understand why. This collapse happened in uh, in Europe, and and just to say, in in the UK, uh, let's just limit us to the English speaking world, and it just didn't happen here. I'm still trying to understand what arguments could be made as to why it didn't happen here, and we're also hyper modern, so modernity can't just be the answer. Yeah, that's a, those are great great questions, and I don't know if I'll ever be able to solve the mystery. And I'm 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 pontificating off the top of my bald head here, but. Um, you're absolutely right. Like the the Soviet Union was knocking on their door. The Baltics had been occupied. Much of you know what we call Eastern Europe really wasn't all that east. I mean, Czechoslovakia was Central Europe. Um, so you're absolutely right. Why would they have been more um, threatened by the Soviet Union and thus doubled down more on their own um, theism and freedom of religion and so on and so forth? I really don't know. I I have to say to me. And I ponder this, I'm not a historian, but it can't be an accident that Darwin comes from the UK and his writings are first published in the UK. Hume comes from the UK and his writings are first published there. We see some of the early skeptical uh, beacons coming from Europe. I, I But I, I really don't, I mean, that's an excellent question. There must be something about European culture that's different than American culture that caused the different responses whereas the US felt like it needed to double down on its faith and its the and its theism the Europe certainly did not uh even though they were in as you said greater uh you know danger I don't know the answer to that I mean it's a really good question yeah I I, I will uh, uh step into your field for a moment as an amateur and just say that uh, at least one question and, and I guess this could be more properly uh in history than in sociology but one question to me would be the role of the elites and in particular, the, the elites of wealth. Because uh, as you look at the UK, uh, there was an erosion of Christian commitment that was pretty evident. I mean, you can see this in Evil in the Walls works and so many other things, um, in a way that seems to have been delayed. And uh, I, I, I think this distinction was noticed by even someone like William F. Buckley Jr., uh, uh, very comfortable on both sides of the Atlantic, who said, you know, the, 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 the elites over there, I mean, over here, you got George, I mean, um, uh, you've got Rockefeller, uh, you know, building the University of Chicago and building a chapel, you know, this monstrous Gothic uh, chapel. I mean, monstrous by large, uh, you, you know, in, in a way that the the British aristocracy had walked away from. So I don't know if that has that's just a little a little rabbit hole uh, of, uh, of historical interest. But uh, the British have an aristocracy and so do we. We just uh, we, our, ours are kind of homemade. Uh, the, the argument uh, I, I walked into as a young man and as a young Christian theologian was uh, largely shaped by people like Peter Berger, uh, 
uh, and, and others. And, and you know, Berger, I, I heard him speak in person a couple of times. And, and you know, he he basically uh, by the 90s was revising a thesis he oh, helped yeah. to develop in the 50s and 60s oh, because yeah. secularization didn't happen the way he thought it was going to happen. But you, you're yeah. arguing in the book and you mentioned Berger respectfully, I would say. But but basically you're arguing that the early Berger was more right than the later Berger. Well, it's not us that's arguing that; it's the data. I mean, All you know, right. Peter Berger was brilliant, a brilliant man. Never, never did a single study of his own. Never talked to a single human being. Never did a survey. Never did any in-depth interviews. Never did any field work. The guy just stayed in his office and wrote a brilliant book. Amazing writer. I love him. I still. Assign. I just have to pause and say that yeah. is one of the most devastating takedowns I have ever heard by a sociologist. <laughs> but I, I just don't want that to pass. Yeah, uh, thank you. Without yeah. notice, yeah. Yeah, I mean, when you actually get your hands dirty, you resent people that don't, you know, when you when you actually have to talk to individuals and try to make sense of what they're saying, when you have to actually have to run some regression analysis, which Peter Berger never did. So this man has this amazing reputation because he was so brilliant. Like I said, I still assign his books. I think Rumor of Angels is genius. I think Sacred Canopy. But what he did in Sacred Canopy in 1967, I believe, yeah, he, he argued that there, the greater pluralism, religious pluralism you have in a given society, you're going to see secular. He didn't provide a, a, an ounce of data to support that. It was all pontification, all theorizing without any evidence to support it. So now you can run the numbers. And what you find is that's exactly what... Absolutely. When there's greater religious pluralism, it's not the only cause of secularization. So even though, you know, Berger recanted and became, you know, Berger was a right winger. He loved Stark. He was, uh, 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 he loved uh, the Lord. And I think at the end of the day, he abandoned his own so sociological wisdom to fit more comfortably with his worldview as an older, older gentleman. But, um, but the data, if anybody can show me evidence to the contrary, I'll revive, you know, that's a difference between, I guess, an empiricist and a non-empiricist. I'm. If you can show me data that's contrary to my position, I'll change my position. But the data shows that Berger, despite his own recanting, was correct in his early theorizing. It's one of the best theories we have for secularization. Okay, so this is a great intellectual puzzle, and you and I may may see it differently, yeah. but it it is a great intellectual puzzle. Why did Peter Berger in the nineties? think that he was wrong in the 60s. In other words, what was he looking at that led him publicly to say, I thought modernity would mean secularization in the United States. Right. It hasn't happened. That's, the, that's his assertion. Yeah. And so I have to revise my theory. Yeah. So, what, what, what was he, so was he wrong in the 1990s? I think you're clearly saying so, but I'll say, why was he wrong? What should he have seen then that he didn't see? Well, that's a good question. This was great. A um, couple things. He was swayed by Rodney Stark. And Rodney Stark, you have to remember, did present himself as an empiricist. Rodney Stark was, uh, 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 you know, presented all kinds of so-called evidence and data. So there was a lot there to contend with. Um, and I would argue that... Um, but in the end of the day, I think I don't know what was going on in Peter Berger's head. I mean, there's a couple factors that I remember in the 90s. Okay, so you saw this big upswing in Pentecostalism, particularly in Latin America, and that got everybody, oh, Pentecostalism's on the move. It's, you know, that was a biggie. You had a real, um, I don't want to, a, a real surge of what we call the Christian right or the religious right, which nobody saw coming. So post 1980s, you suddenly saw all these groups having, seeming to have a tremendous sway in our American culture, uh, a media empire is blossoming, uh, taking over of school boards, taking over of city councils. So you saw this great success on that front. So there were various indicators of Mormons seem to be growing, although that's leveled off a bit. But, you know, so there were if you wanted to find strong religious movements, you could find those around the world. Also, just in terms of who has more babies, the more religious you are, the more babies you tend to have. So demographically. But it's when you say, what was Peter Berger looking at then? I would say it's what was he not looking at? <laughs> just look at basic data of frequency of prayer, church attendance, faith and belief in God. Like the data, it was just emerging then. Um, there wasn't a lot, but now it's all there. So I personally think think Peter Berger was um, more ideological in his later years. I think he was more uh, trying and he didn't, it was, it was, 
the exact things that Stark and Berger accused the early secularization theorists of, they accused, they, it's very ad hominem. They said, oh, these guys, they're just, they don't like religion. They want it to go away. They wish it would go away. So they're theorizing it's going away. I would say <laughs> it's the exact same thing with Stark and Finke and Yannakoni and Christian Smith and Peter Berger. They were all theists, more or less of varying shades, who liked religion, thought secularism was a bad force in society and just didn't want to accept that it was on the rise. So are you just doing that in reverse? Except we have data. So, you know, I think there there is a degree of it. We are like, ah, no, nah, no, nah, I told you so. But, you know, I, I had to fight my, I don't, want, I don't want to say who, but I would say um, one of my co-authors was definitely more Starkian in his or her approach. And I tried to say, hey, we're not here to, this is not tit for tat. This is not, you know, use it. Like we have to let the data speak for itself. And that's what I think we've done uh, in this book. I think we've presented, these are our reasons why we think secularization has occurred exactly along the lines that the classical thinkers predicted it would. They didn't have the data. I think we do. So let's talk a little bit about the conversation we're having now. Uh, evangelical theologian talks to a professor of secular studies. And uh, so yeah. we're, 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 we're talking, uh, we know who we are. We can have a conversation here. Love I think it. what might surprise many people is that uh, I, I, I think both of us have a great deal of investment in the data. I'm not a sociologist, I'm a theologian, but I respect uh, the presentation of the data. I also think there's something else going on here, and that is that I am not encouraged by false claims about religiosity, uh, nor are you, maybe for equal and opposite reasons. But right. I think there's a grave danger that uh, a lot of Christians in the United States will claim more for Christianity than can be sustained in any kind of honest argument mm. on the ground. And so I lament the fact that more Americans are not Christians. I think others may celebrate the fact that more Americans are not Christians. But I think it's at least a matter of intellectual honesty to say, I think both sides in this argument um, may well be troubled by false claims about religiosity that uh, just don't impress me. Mm. I appreciate that. It is interesting, even though we're on such opposite sides of our worldviews, um, I think it's fun to have this conversation. So I'll give you an example of what you just how what you just said plays out in my work. Uh -huh. so there's a lot of talk about the rise of the nuns, the N O N E S S, right. not singing nuns from Sound of Music, but people who, when asked what is your religion, they say none, none of the above. I'm none of these. So you see this big rise of the nuns in the last 30 years or so. Certainly generationally, it's exploded. Whenever I talk about that data, there's always people in the audience who say. They'll raise their hand and say, well, just because someone says they're non-religious, that doesn't mean they don't have a personal relationship with Jesus or they aren't a believer in God. And they'll say, you know, so your numbers are, 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 are screwy, Zuckerman, because you're saying these people are secular. All that all it means, though, is that they don't they don't call themselves a Lutheran or a Mennonite or whatever, but they still believe in God or Jesus. And I'll say you're absolutely 100 percent correct. There's a there's a church half a mile from here where they say we're not religious we have a relationship so they won't identify as religious on the other hand what i say to them is do you know how many people i interview who do identify as religious but don't believe why would they identify as religious of course i'm catholic my family's catholic yeah sure we're episcopalian i went to a summer camp when i was a kid yeah well i think we're 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 methodists because uh, my wife sings in the choir like so there's a lot of people who identify as religious who even go to church, right, because of a spouse right. or whatever, who right. do not have any personal faith whatsoever. They don't even know about the details of the faith in order to reject it, right? Do you know how many people don't even know? You know, I, I could go on and on. So from my perspective— You can almost I, assuredly answer that question, yes. I think we, yeah. for different reasons, we share exactly. a common concern about how much cognitive commitment uh, exactly. to uh, Christian theology is found among many people who claim to be Christian. Exactly. So it's interesting. So I agree with you, obviously, for different reasons. I think I'm curious. I'm interested in that because I think secular folks are are, are being undercounted. You're probably uh, tentative to that because it has to do with people's salvation and whether or not they're really truly saved and so on and so forth. And there is kind of a two track thing going on here, because uh, in uh, in the larger social context of American political and cultural life, uh, I would argue against many who would call themselves secularists that there's an essential Christian background uh, to uh, so many of these commitments that uh, that I try to foreground. 
but at the same time, uh, having an honest conversation about these things is is difficult, and and such conversations are rare. And and I am not a sociologist; I'm a theologian. I respect, uh, however, I, I want to respect the data. I, I want to ask you about the data for a moment. One of the things that frustrates me when I look at polls and or any just about any survey. Uh, and this would include even, I think, uh, work of the quality of the of Pew, for example. Uh, I, I think a lot of what they do is just incredibly credible. Uh, it just still doesn't answer my questions. A- and so it's all how you define terms. Absolutely. A- and so how how do you actually determine, even just sociologically, if someone is a theist? How, how you know, in other words, how, how do you, Professor Zuckerman, uh, actually uh, define that? How, how would I know how you're defining it? Great, great, great stuff here. This is really getting to the heart of you know methodology and how we even understand what it is we're trying to analyze. And, and what you just said about surveys and polls, you mentioned one problem, like how do you, the terms you're using, what do they even mean? How do they, they can right. mean different things to different people. That's just one problem. Don't get me started on sampling methods and generalizability, response rates. I mean, there's a host of problems with polls and surveys. So we're really making do with the best available data, which itself is not perfect. It's quite flawed. So what I try to say is there's different ways you can approach um, 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 terms, right? There's there's a general understandings of terms, but there's what an individual person might mean by a term. And this is where, to be quite honest, this is why I do in-depth interviews. So a survey, I can ask a person, do you believe in God? And I can give them some options. Yes, uh, sometimes, not sure, probably not, no, I don't know. You know, we can give them different answers. But what does God even mean to them? What if what if I what if God means to them, you know, an ultimate force of all being? I don't even really know what that means, right? So when I have an in-depth interview, I can sit down with a person and unpack it. So the good thing about an in-depth interview is I can really get to the heart of what they mean. The bad thing is I can't give it a numeric value. I can't run it in a survey. So if I have a our conversation with someone about what God means to them, I'm getting a very rich understanding of what it means to them. I can't then turn around and say, 68% of Estonians think God is this. I can't do that. It's yeah. a conversation. When I think of a theist, um, you know, I think it's someone who claims to believe in God. Now, I've never understood the God concept. I've never heard of a reasonable definition of God that makes any logical sense to me. So it's not that anybody's ever defined God and I've said, oh, I see what you mean. Any definition of God I've ever heard always just raises more questions, seems philosophically unreasonable, untenable, contradictory. I don't, you can't be omniscient and omnipotent at the same time. These things don't work. So I don't really know what a true theist is, but if someone tells me they believe in God, I think they're a theist. All right. Wow. An awful lot to unpack there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no. I haven't had, you gotta be, I gotta warn you, I haven't had my lunch yet, so I'm even going to get more crazy as, as the uh, hour. All right. All right. Well, uh, you know, the conversation is lively because we're talking about matters of ultimate importance. And, uh, you know, it, it also gets down to something else. And that is, we're talking about the data. I'll tell you what informs me. Data about who goes to church and who doesn't. Okay. That oh, that informs me because and and there you talk about behavior. I think of the b- the belief, the belonging, behavior. The one that's actually more objectively verifiable, if people are honest, is, is the behavior. Absolutely. You so what does that it. what does that you tell you it. now? Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Behavior is the one you know. Belief is in someone's head. So we either have to interpret it because they tell us something, or they write something, or they sing a song. We don't really know what's in people's hearts and minds. We can watch them go to church. We can watch them attend a Bible session. We can watch them circumcise their kids. We can watch them, you know, ritually scar themselves. Like what people do around their religion can be is much more reliable as it can be observed, it can be counted, and so on and so forth. Yeah. But I'm curious. So when you say church attendance, I think church attendance is a very valid uh, indicator of of religious behavior, but I don't. I think you were saying it's not necessarily a, a a good indicator of theism because they could be attending church and still not believe. Is that correct for you? Uh, no, I would say I would say I think the causal link is is uh, is much stronger than that. I was kind oh, of arguing. Okay. What I'm saying is I I'm not 
putting a whole lot of trust in what any poll or survey tells me about what people say they believe about God. I want to know, do you believe in God enough not to golf on Sunday morning, but to come to church? Gotcha. So the person that's just out there driving their car and 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 going to work and whatever, uh, uh, hunting and, and and singing and whatnot, and says, oh, yeah, sure, I believe in God, carries less weight for you because there's no right. provable yes. commitment. But, the, you know, right. if you're going to go to church once or twice or three times a week, that's going to be kind of an indication that you're, you take your faith seriously. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, Judaism is its own way of defining this. Uh, but for Christianity, and by the way, in, in all, you know, just take, take the three major historic branches, where you have Catholicism, Orthodoxy, and, uh, and Protestantism, all three have been absolutely united in a Lord's Day duty. Oh, that's interesting. And, yeah. and so wherever you look there, uh, oh, you, you find out who really is signaling faithful adherence to, uh, to the, the theology by whether or not they, they show up uh, uh, in church or not. Oh, and okay. so it's plummeting church attendance statistics that speak most mm-hmm. powerfully to me. I, I, I like that. And I think I think that it's sociologically sound too. There's something about, you know, people it's it's you know, the, the, the sort of you can ask someone who they're supporting for presidency, but if they don't go to the voting booth, it's all for naught. Like right. you know, you can ask right. someone, you know, do they play violin? And if they say, sure, I'm really talented, but they never pick one up. It's what's the, so I agree with you that uh, what people actually do is probably a stronger indicator of, of what's going on. Uh, in your book, you, uh, it, it, it's a little pugilistic at times. I think kind of, you know, for a book of this length and, and in this market, so to speak, it, it, it's, it definitely makes punches. Uh, and, and, and you, uh, you, you kind of outline these, as a matter of fact, at times you kind of set it out, you know, Thesis, we disagree with that. Here's the data, and, and you go on. Uh, you do raise the question, and you, in honesty, raised this earlier about uh, reversibility uh, or inevitability. Uh, so I guess the question I'm asked by other Christian leaders rather constantly is, uh, is there any way to undo this? Uh, <laughs> or or, or, or is, is there some circumstance that, that might lead to change? By your own definitions, what would that look like? How to reverse secularization? No, I'm not saying how to. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I'm not suggesting you have a machine. I'm just saying uh, you in the book, you lay yeah. out, here are some things that would perhaps slow down the process of secularization. And you have to deal with it with real-life situations, or at least apparently, uh, mm-hmm. Poland, Hungary, uh, Korea, mm-hmm. uh, Africa. Uh, but I think Poland and, uh, and Hungary, uh, and Poland in particular, uh, presents a real challenge, uh, you might say, to both sides in this argument to to describe. Mm. Okay, so let me just make sure I got the question. So you're asking me, what do I think might hinder secularization? Or Is slow it a... down, or, or even down. put the process into reverse. Right. Is that conceivable? What would that look like? Yeah. So for me, I would say there's a, a bunch of ways to approach that. Um I I personally I can't speak for my co-authors think that in if 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 life gets more and more precarious you're going to see a greater need for faith and religion and the comfort that comes with certain forms of theism. So what do I mean by precarious? Well, I think if global war as global warming increases and and there's more tornadoes and more hurricanes and more floods and more droughts and more people are suffering, you're going to see an uptick in the need for supernatural help. Um, I think as we, uh, if inequality increases, if we continue to slash funding for hospitals and healthcare and education, I, th- I think if, if life gets more miserable, I hate to say it, I think that's good for religion. I think people turn to religion when they're suffering or when there's crises. So I'm not at, I don't, you know, so you can see where I'm going here. I don't want those things to occur, but I think that will do it. Another one I think is what we talk about cultural defense. When people feel threatened for other reasons, when they feel that their ethnicity is under attack or their race is under attack or their nationality is under attack, religion helps bolster all of those three. So religion is a strong feeder to national sentiment, not always. Religion is a strong feeder to ethnic identity often. Religion is a strong. So I can imagine if we, if, 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 so just, I'll give you, for example, I can see a kind of surge in religious identity as Islam becomes more prominent or numerous in the United States. There's kind of like a, well, if that's coming, we need to, re, you know, and that's not really, is it really about theology? I actually don't think so. I think it's about social identity, group belonging, tribalism, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
the other thing I would say is, and I don't know how to how to say this, but I will tip my hat a little bit to Rodney Stark, and that is there is something about marketing to religion. Uh, certainly, how does one spread good news? Uh, 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 if you want to spread the good news of Jesus's resurrection and his and potential to salvation, you have to do that in a compelling way. Um, and it seems as though, uh, again, if this is not my wheelhouse, this is your wheelhouse, but um, I guess you got to, I don't think having a, you know, egocentric pig of a leader as your front man is going to do much good here in the United States. You know, I don't think, I think Trump holding up a Bible did more to damage the Christian brand than anything some, you know, frothy mouthed, angry atheist could ever do. Uh, I just, I would be very careful not to align your faith with some uh, despotic, you know, gun loving dictator who wants to subvert the constitution. And and I know people are going to disagree about my characterization of Trump, but I believe history will bear me out on that front. Um, also, I think that, um, you know, the baby, the baby issue is big. You know, people tend to stay in the religion they're raised in. So as long as, you know, Mormons keep having more babies. I mean, let's take the case of Israel. Israel was quite secular, at least in terms of belief, uh, for much of its founding. But it's going to be a Jewish Iran in about 20 years. You're going to have the fundamentalist Orthodox Jews have about 12 kids, you know, have five times as many kids as the secular Jews. So simply in terms of birth rates, you're seeing Israel turn into a Orthodox Jewish, uh, uh, it'll be a it'll be a theocratic nation uh, very soon, and that's almost just a demographic shift. Yeah. I don't think any you know it's just so. Those are off the top of my unfed head. Those are some thoughts there. Well, I'm curious I will, if, I, uh, if I provoked you at all. <laughs> no, I'll get you quickly to lunch, but I'm not going to bite on the political apple you offered me there. Uh, okay. <laughs> wise move, wise move. But I am going to say that uh, I, I wanted to get to the birth rate issue because just about every major newspaper has in the last six weeks run major front page articles. Japan, you know, they're, they're having to look at robots oh, yeah. in, in uh, nursing homes. Uh, and Israel is, is, is the other big situation. But you can talk yeah. about Manhattan or Brooklyn, yeah. uh, where among, among uh, the, the, the Jewish population there, uh, it, it's going to be demographically a reversal of what had been, you know, largely reformed Judaism in the center. It's, it's going to be a far more orthodox Judaism at the center. I don't think that's an accident. That's one of the reasons why I, I think that as uh, the birth rate plummets, I, 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 I think big cosmological, metaphysical, theological questions are going to come more to the forefront. And I think that's, that's where it enters into my terrain. Gotcha. Yeah. I think there's no question that, um, as societies become wealthier, more prosperous, and more secular, they have fewer kids. I mean, it is there's no question about that. And while I think there's a lot of good that comes with secularization and secularism, it's not all good. It's not all balloons and roses from my perspective. There's other pathologies that seem to correlate with it as well. And that's one of them, the low birth rate for sure. Well, our time's coming to an end. I want to ask you one last question. So by the time this is published, you're already working on something new. So what what are you working on now? Oh, that's interesting. Um, thanks for asking. Um, right now, so you mentioned something earlier um, about how a person, for example, in the United States today could say they're not religious or even not a believer, but they are so embedded in the Christian heritage and Christian culture, either of their parents' generation or their grandparents' generation, or just the society in which they live in. So right now I'm trying to study the most secular humans I can find on uh -huh. the most atheistic on planet Earth. And so these are people that live in societies that are majority non-theistic, who have parents and grandparents who are not believers. So I'm trying to really understand their worldview and what can we learn about them and from them. And I think the findings would surprise your average American. Um, they're not the bloodthirsty, amoral, you know, uh, 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 psychopaths a lot of people would imagine. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking into those kind of people. Well, I can say, honestly, I look forward to reading that research. And uh, I want to thank you for joining me today for Thinking in Public. Once again, it's uh, it's been a privilege to have the conversation. I am so glad you're out there. I'm so, you know, we may disagree on a lot, but man, you are a beacon. You're uh, in many ways, just the, I'm so grateful that you had me on and I'm so grateful you do the work that you do. So thank well, you. Well, may the conversation continue. God bless you. Take care.
Many thanks to my guest, Professor Phil Zuckerman, for thinking with me today. If you enjoyed today's episode of Thinking in Public, you'll find about 185 of these conversations at albertmuller.com under the tab Thinking in Public. For more information on the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, go to sbts.edu. For information on Boyce College, just go to boycecollege.com. Thank you for joining me for Thinking in Public. Until next time, keep thinking.